everybody. It's uh, three o'clock uh, Swedish time anyway, uh, or Central European summer time. And uh, it's time for <clears throat> this uh, latest webinar, which uh, the topic this time is open education for refugees. It's about social inclusion, empowerment, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the This webinar is being uh, provided by a number of projects and organizations, primarily the Moonlight Project, MOOCs for Social Inclusion and Employability. We are also part of the EDEN webinar series. EDEN is the European Distance and E-Learning Network. Uh, and it's also part of uh, ITHU, which is the uh, Swedish Network for IT and Higher Education, and also the Nordic Network for um, adult learning, NVL. So it's actually under four flags, this webinar. So uh, welcome everyone. You've come from one of these networks. So it's good to see a, a nice gathering. Uh, there are now uh, 46 of us in this room. Uh, we had about uh, 110 registered uh, a couple of an hour ago. So welcome everybody. <clears throat> you have uh, you probably heard the idea that open education, um, the people who need open education most are generally don't know anything about it and don't know it exists and are not able to take advantage of it. And the situation in Europe and around the rest of the world today is that we, we have a real reason for developing open education, but we need to make people aware of it. And these people are primarily refugees, asylum seekers, people who are displaced or disadvantaged in some way. We have to try and make open education, and in particular MOOCs, available to them, help them to uh, get on board and find ways of making them actually useful to them. And we're going to start the discussion today. We'll be continuing with several more webinars during the year on this topic. So. I'll just explain that uh, so far we've got uh, we've got this time we've got three guests in the studio you could say virtually I'll just get them my name is uh, Alistair Creelman by the way I come from uh, Linnaeus University in Kalmar in the southeast of Sweden and I'm a member of uh, all these four organizations in particular the Moonlight Project with me I have uh, Paula Say a few words. Thank you so much for the invitation and also the project project as well. And I look forward to sharing and working with all. Okay, John, a couple of words of introduction. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to share a few ideas and get some feedback. I'm based in the UK, as Alistair said, and as you can see from the map. Okay, and Jennifer. Good afternoon. So I'm Jennifer Gutierrez. I am also working at Pinais University together with Alistair Trailman, and I'm working with the validation of competency for asylum seekers and refugees here in Linnea. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Thanks. Okay, you'll be hearing from our three, from the three guest speakers in due course. Uh, they'll each have a short session where they'll be providing you with some input. And while you're listening to their input, uh, try and think of questions to ask them. Think of uh, points you'd like to make or follow up or discussion points. And after each uh, short input, you'll get time to discuss with them, ask them questions, and put forward your views. And uh, for efficiency's sake, we will ask you to do that in a chat window. Uh, and in poll questions, so it'll be very much text-based interaction with you. So if you, if everybody is okay with that, uh, it's nice to see the spread on the map there below us of people from all over Europe and even over in the USA. 
As I can see from the poll on the left, are you already using open education in a refugee context? We have three examples of already in operation. It would be nice to get some links for those in operation. Uh, four people planning to, seven people considering, and uh, much the, the majority at the moment haven't started. And I think that's still quite uh, symptomatic. There are a lot of projects going, but there are also a lot of people thinking about it. OK, it's time then to uh, welcome the first speaker. And it's John to give us a little bit of the, uh, the overview on all this. So it's over to you, John. OK, Alistair, thank you very much. Um, I suppose I'm here um, because of my involvement with the Moonlight project and it probably would make some sense in talking about refugees to firstly to say something about my background and then something about what it is that MOOCs might be and what the idea could possibly mean. So um, I'm a professor of digital learning at the University of Wolverhampton in the Institute of Education and my specialism over the last 20 years has been mobile learning. Um, in the course of the last five or seven years, I've worked extensively with UNWA, the UN agency responsible for Palestinian refugees in the Middle East, specifically in uh, Jordan, Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, um, and also with several British Council and Erasmus projects working with Jordanian and Palestinian universities. So in that sense, I'm very conscious of maybe some of the culture and the context and the conditions that many of the refugees come from. Um, and I guess that informs quite a lot of what I say. Um, I'm also conscious there are many other aspects of both MOOCs and of the refugee situation that I know very little about. Um, but as I say, my contribution is to try and describe very briefly to people who are not familiar with them what MOOCs are. Um, and in one sense, it's quite simple, um, and it, in another sense, it's quite complex and confused. It's quite simple because it just means massive, open, online courses. And they grew out of um, developmental work in Canadian universities some years ago. Um, and I guess that portrays their, if you like, cultural background um, and, and begs questions immediately about is the whole phenomenon culturally and contextually specific. You know, did they work for Canada? Can they work anywhere else? Um, are they an essentially developed world uh, Anglophone phenomenon? Um, and that might be, as it were, an academic question in the European university context. But outside the European university context, it's quite a significant question. So that's their background, North America. Um, but to look at the, the, the words one by one, as this slide does, uh, what exactly do they mean by massive? Um, and that's a significant question, partly because the original work in Canada was exploring the potential and the possibilities around massive connectivity and massive communities. So what exactly did they mean? And is there a cutoff or a threshold around this idea of massive? And as the slide says, is it 10 or 100,000 or whatever, you know? Um, secondly, what's the meaning of open? Uh, I mean, apart from anything else, does it mean free? Uh, is there a distinction between free and open? Um, does it mean free or does it mean affordable? So there's the nature of openness is not straightforward. And it's certainly in other contexts um, of the open movement, we've seen a lot of um, diverse opinions and, and actually concerns about whether open merely privileges and gives resources to people who've largely got privileges and resources already. Uh, and again, refugees might not be the people with um, privileges and resources. So actually, is this an opportunity they can actually um, grasp, or is it actually one that's denied to them for a variety of other reasons? Um, it says online. And again, does that mean synchronous, asynchronous? Does it mean kind of uh, large, amorphous, and undifferentiated? Or does it mean somehow broken up uh, into smaller groups that can interact at a more human level with each other. And then finally, what exactly does course mean? Does it mean a, a synchronous course with a start date and a stop date? Does it assume some kind of formative or summative assessment, some kind of accreditation? Um, is there a sense of community that 
that builds up, or is it a largely kind of uh, anonymous um, phenomenon? And certainly, whilst this might seem like kind of maybe hair splitting, it's important when we started looking at the MOOCs available to refugees, or indeed those online offerings which portray themselves as um, MOOCs, where do they fit into this categorization? What are the answers to these questions? Are they um, conventional online computer-aided learning, or are they something more um, up-to-date, more responsive, more reactive than that? So those, those are a few questions about the meaning of MOOC and how it pans out in different communities. And you can see those questions being played out along this timeline as well, where you can see the original idea being informed by, if you like, a kind of ideological uh, notion of openness reflected in open source software, open content, and being played out in the Open University and in MIT, specifically in them making their courses available. Then you have actually, in the 2008-10 uh, um, epoch, the actual connectivist MOOC itself coming on stream. And if you then look forwards in time, what you see is a kind of diversification as the original ideas and the original way of doing it became to a large extent um, corporate platforms for high, high quality media broadcasting and corporate training and, and various very sophisticated platforms being placed underneath the universities that are offering, offering MOOC courses. So again, you can see a kind of diversification, people having different reasons, um, different ways of operationalizing the idea of a MOOC. And actually, apart from anything else, uh, still wondering exactly what the educational point is or the, the business case is. Is it just making everything available for everyone, in which case, how do we fund these things? Or is it a, a, a revenue stream, in which case, uh, what, what exactly is the nature of that revenue stream? To put that point a slightly different way, these are um, some of the some of the large platforms underneath the current MOOCs being offered by a range of universities, um, and you maybe could argue that Moodle is one of them or not, but certainly edX or Coursera um, or FutureLearn are. But you can see rather different characteristics across those different platforms. Um, a, a radically different way of looking at the MOOC phenomenon, maybe a more kind of um, fundamentalist way is is something we did uh, five or six years ago from entirely free and open source software uh, where we saw a vast number of people, I mean sorry, 600 people just finding out about it virally and taking part and it being a phenomenal experience of interactivity of lots of very clever fascinating people be offering stuff from everyone else for everyone else to learn from. So you've got this whole range of um, ideas about what a MOOC is, what it could offer, how you might deliver it. But just finally, um, they are largely an Anglophone phenomenon um, with a very small number of technical platforms. EDRAC is one of the few available in Arabic. Um, and so that illustrates once you've broken out of the global north and the languages of the global north, there isn't very much available, and that's clearly a significant issue for people whose mother tongues aren't uh, English, German, or French. Uh, so I hope that's a, a reasonable summary of, of the issues. Um, a word or two about Moonlight. We're a group of people interested in expanding social inclusion and employability through MOOCs for the refugee communities um, across Europe. Those are our partners, as I say, we're involved in higher education in one sense or another, either as discrete universities or consortia um, or social enterprises. And we have a number of um, activities and outputs surveying what's available at the moment, looking for best practice, uh, developing some tools, and then developing some exemplar courses at our own universities and then synthesizing them across our various host universities in order to generate some guidelines for policymakers within the management and, of, uh, and strategy of higher education. So that was a very brief and rushed 
run through of the possibilities that loops offer in general and problems about how, what they might have to offer for refugees in particular. Uh, and I'll hand back over to Alistair now and see if anyone's got any questions. Okay. Um, now the chat is bigger. Uh, I wrote there in the chat at the end that all the slideshows, you can download them if you if you so desire at the end of the webinar. So uh, that's, that's, that's taken care of. Um, <clears throat> so uh, ideas about the about MOOCs and um, about them being used in this uh, how how do we get uh, how do we get re MOOCs interesting to refugees what are refugees needs and are can MOOCs actually supply something here uh, so far I think John a lot of the a lot of the people involved in MOOCs have been in a way the people who as I said earlier, probably least need them. They tend to be very much uh, people with a university background, uh, generally professional people who are wanting to sort of learn a little bit more about a new subject rather than opening up to people who are not, who are not, don't have access to higher education. Yeah, certainly the successes in the UK have proved to be three, three week long, six week long um, CPD, uh, professional development courses for people already in jobs with a specific career objective and actually our experience with the Moby MOOC one was that you need a fairly high level of digital literacy and um, subject knowledge to start with and the original idea was based around a lot of mutual interaction and contribution uh, and so people without that background or without the necessary digital literacy would sink without a trace um, and I suppose that was predicated implicitly on the idea that all these people involved had access to the right kind of technology coverage connections um, as well that they were sitting in front of um, high spec network desktop PCs uh, and certainly future learn has gone more in the direction of making it more device independent and mobile accessible but that's at a technological level rather than at the level of asking whether people have got the finance and the uh, the technology within their grasp. Uh, so I think there's a number of, of issues um, along those lines about you know what it is that MOOCs do at the moment and how is that relevant to what they could be doing for refugees. Yeah, I think uh, there are some there are several people typing here. We we'll just wait till they come up. But uh, I think the digital literacy thing and the access to infrastructure are two key questions, and uh, I think that's possibly why many people have not been accessing open education. They simply don't know it's there. They don't know how to get onto it. They don't have anyone to help them. Uh, there's Johanny uh, asking a question. Yeah, I think there's a more general answer to Johanny's question, and that is how little we might know uh, about the I don't know, expectations or the experiences of refugees. And that's not to uh, bunch them all together and to say all refugees are the same, just that we don't know very much about how different they are, either from what we're expecting, what we're used to, or from each other. Um, and you know, one of those um, expectations and experiences we might need to explore is their experiences of education, of being in an education system, of what education might consist of, and why you why why you might be having an education. You know, is it for uh, a kind of liberal ideals about being a better person, or to get you a qualification, or to get you a job? You know. And those three things might overlap and they might not, but we'd have to be very clear why it is people come to MOOCs and what their expectations, their competences and their experiences are that they're bringing to the MOOC. Yeah, and there's Francisca's asked a question. How do you measure starting level of refugees, their knowledge, skills, devices, internet access? Well, I think that's a question we, we certainly need to be asking and we probably don't have the answer to. Um, and until we do, it's, it's largely either prejudice or guesswork. Prejudice meaning stuff we already do with our existing um, stakeholders and communities or guesswork, um, stuff we think should work. But like I say, I think we have a, um, a very poor idea of actually what it's like to be living as a refugee essentially before you've entered the formal system 
uh, you know, before you've entered the, the procedures and the formalities of, of Western European countries. Indeed, and Olivia very clearly, um, I think that's also <laughs> a very relevant point that, um, as I think uh, our later speakers will point out, uh, refugees want hard currency. They want uh, they want something on their CV. And will well, I'm not even clear that they have. Give, will Sorry, I was going to say, I'm not even clear if they have CVs in the sense that we might mean it, or that their expectations about how you earn a living are necessarily ones where qualifications are the route to it. You know, they're, they're the economic practices of wherever they've come from may, may be very, very different from the kind of institutionalized qualifications that we give that largely get people jobs in corporations or formalized businesses. True, but uh, they're very keen to get into the new society okay. and whatever yeah. whatever is required. And But if MOOCs are not a way of getting in or getting recognized, then maybe they're not so interesting. Yeah. So. OK, I will. Uh, I think we can we can move on and actually for, from going to I mean John's John's sort of overview of what are we talking about about MOOCs about open education and so on and some of the it's not as simple as people think uh, we're often um, we often think that a MOOC is one particular thing and it as you said it, it's very many things and uh, uh, it depends what sort of MOOC what sort of course we're talking about we're going to move on now to uh, Paula. And she's been working in the field uh, also, as John has done, but uh, she's been working in the field and offering MOOCs to refugees and has uh, quite a lot of experience on this. If I could move over now to uh, Paola into the discussion. And your presentation should turn up next to us any second now. And for those of you on the chat, everyone out there, as uh, Paola is is, is uh, talking, think of questions, think of some points, and keep the chat going. And uh, you'll get time to ask her and make your points uh, as, as soon as she's finished. So I'll hand over to Paola. Thanks, Alistair. Um, thank you so much once again for the invitation. I'm going to present is the project that I'm currently working in Jordan and uh, Lebanon and Syria. And we have been working with the European Commission. This is a funded project by the European Commission, and it's being implemented by the British Council. Uh, just a very brief overview about the project. It's a three-year uh, project funded by the European Union. It targets Syrians, so that is our main target group, in, uh, in refugees, Syrian, uh, Syrian refugees, and also disadvantaged Jordanian in Jordan. Uh, and Syrians in Lebanon, in this case, ref refugees, uh, Syrians in Lebanon, and also uh, Syrians in Lebanon itself. Uh, the idea is that we have the language and academic skills, so moving from the language to uh, bringing them, the refugees, to the online accredited courses and also to the sh online short courses for 400 participants. This is a target group, a very specific target group, target group that we have from 18 to 30 years old. So it was something that we found that would be important to have this, uh, this time, uh, time frame as they were lost within the, the education system and within their own uh, possibility to learn. Uh, and we are using, so following from what John has just said, we are using uh, MOOCs with the future learn so OER and the, also the the open education side and MOOCs and SPOCs with a drug which is in Arabic. So we have these two uh, different uh, partners working with us. What we have decided was that we are MOOCs can mean, as John said, lots of different things. So what we created, it was uh, what we consider our own uh, working definition for MOOCs. What are MOOCs for our group and for what we are doing? So participant is part of larger cohorts. 
not only in the project, but they can come and join the larger cohort in terms of the of the of the MOOC. Uh, they will particip the participant will attend the MOOC within the date provided by the MOOC provider, or in case of the self-paced course when we launch the registration. The participant will go to the learning center whenever he or she needs, because one of the things that we came across is the accessibility and uh, having access, uh, access to the internet. So it was a major consideration how they could access it. Uh, and uh, I'll be going back to that question that Francisca has, uh, asked, us, has asked a few minutes ago. Um, the participant will be provide the proof of participation and will also issue an open badge. So it was a way for us to define what it was, uh, uh, what it was there. Um, regarding SPOX, we define it in a different manner. So dates will be defined by uh, the British Council. The participants will be part of a small cohort and we have created small uh, classes with other participants registered with, within the project. It becomes part of the specialization and what it did, it was create an employment specialization. And when I'm saying create, it was the EDRAC, they had already several uh, MOOCs that we can see that could be part of the employment specialization and we uh, launched it as a specialization. So it was a way of using whatever we have and make the most of it without, uh, without extra costs. It's supported by a facilitator, so we have someone who is supporting this, the learner during the, during the, uh, the, the SPOC um, while it's taking place. It is a flipped classroom and with community-based learning and active methods, so we involve them in the community. Most of them, this is taking place in learning centers, uh, which are located in Amman, in Zatari refugee camp, and we'll be launching shortly in Azraq refugee camp as well. And we'll issue a participant a certificate in the end. Uh, what we did was a pilot, just to check how it, how it would go, and then see how we could move on. Uh, and it was very interesting because we start having learners finding themselves also jobs inside of the refugee camps. Main challenges that we had to that we had to face internet access. Uh, it is a major uh, a major challenge, uh, especially inside of the refugee camps for security reasons. Uh, the location because it requires for them to move with the learning center, for instance. It requires the refugees to move to that learning center and that poses uh, constraints in terms of, uh, of transport, the language, uh, the mobility. So it's a very mobile uh, group, which means that they are in one place and the next week or the next day they can be somewhere else, with some of them going back to Syria and coming out of Syria, going to a different country, so that is something that we need to keep uh, uh, exactly so now. It could be local and cultural centers could be a good place to use as learning centers. Uh, the other thing that we came across is that they are not used to learner-centered approaches, so they are very much used to teacher-centered approaches, uh, which requires another mindset. Uh, and, and that was the reason why you are using active uh, approaches, uh, active methods, and also community-based uh, uh, approaches. Uh, digital literacy, they all, most of them, and it was something that we uh, did several surveys, so we have around 95% of them uh, who are uh, using mobile phones uh, with smartphones, so it's, uh, and we are talking about Syrian. That is something that I want to make sure is that uh, it's clear to all of you is that when we are talking about about refugees, we have a huge, we are totally different. So it's please always have that in mind that when I'm talking about digital literacy in this situation, we are talking about Syrians. So they are very different with very different needs, Katerina, as you were saying. So that is something that we always need to take into account. 
Um, and so these, for instance, these participants, they have 95% of them are with uh, smartphones. Uh, 95, almost all of them, they have a Facebook account and they are using WhatsApp. So that is our reality with this target group. And the other is the engagement, how to engage them and how to keep them going and all that. So these are the main constraints that we face. Retention. MOOCs are very similar to the other contexts. So we have about a 5 to 7 percent retention rate uh, in terms of our MOOCs. Uh, when it comes to SPOCs, uh, then we have a 50% retention rate. So we could see that there is a huge difference between using the typical uh, MOOC or using a different approach as we did with the uh, SPOCs. The employability specialization, uh, it has two participants already found employment inside of Zatari refugee camp, for instance, and it was just for the first module because the specialization goes from uh, creating your CV, uh, presentation skills, branding, uh, and just for the CV, two of them were already able to find a job uh, because of it. Um, so it was very, very, uh, yes, with the, with the flipped classroom approach, Elser, so it's not just a small private, so yes, exactly, Matt. So it was really a success for us and we are really happy about it. I just want to, to finish my presentation with this, with this uh, phrase from one of our students. Uh, in my mind, I'm hopeful and always searching for opportunities to improve myself and those around me. I'm not in Azra camp, I am in the future, because my mind is in the future and I'm taking any opportunity that will help me to complete my studies, studies which were interrupted by the war in Syria. So I want just to share this with you. So thank you so much. Great, thanks, Paula. Uh, <coughs> so, folks, uh, some uh, ideas from you now. Uh, I noticed there's been a few things in the in the chat there. But, uh, Sonal in Belgium, the local libraries and cultural centers are very important as learning centers for newcomers. Uh, do you see that as a, how do you see that, Paola? Because we need, where, where do we find these, that sort of on the ground support in Europe? My suggestion is just be creative and don't be afraid to, to ask because sometimes if we go there, for instance, uh, in the case of Azraq, uh, it was Kuze who was asking to other organizations if they could go there and, uh, and have internet, internet access with other organizations besides the partners that we had found because of the, of the location, because it was easier for them to go to that specific location, because the camps are huge. Uh, We seem to have lost you, Paula. I don't know if you can hear us, but uh, your connection has gone. Uh, I can see some of the, the, co the comments here that, uh, yeah, the, the, the dropout rate in MOOCs, uh, of course, is notoriously quite low in many of these massive uh, co courses that you see re reported on the media. But with Paula's, uh, they got sort of 50% retention and more, and that's, uh, that's very, very good. But then they're, they're generally very motivated. Uh, again, there's been a lot of discussion about the, um, the, the dropout rates in MOOCs over the years because um, what do you mean by dropout? Many of the people who so-called drop out of MOOCs never actually dropped in. They actually, they just register and then never do anything so that uh, you can't count them as dropouts. Uh, I don't know if John or uh, Jennifer could jump in here and uh, help me with uh, some of the questions and comments here because we have lost Paula at the moment. Um, it would be, it would be nice to, yeah, it would be, hi John, I, I mean you've been working uh, also with the Palestinian camps and so on, I mean uh, there's, Johanny is asking Paula here about how are the participants communications used as a resource in the courses? Have, you any uh, experience of that? 
Part of my work recently was trying to identify what actually digital literacy might mean in the context of the Palestinian refugee community. Uh, and I suppose I come up with a working definition, which is not the same as everyone else's, but is actually something to do with the difference between what people can do and what people could do. Um, yep. You know, the kind of opportunities they might access if only they had this thing called digital literacy. And clearly that's very, very context specific and very culturally specific. Um, uh, and yes, there's always the obvious. Oh, sorry. Someone else Sorry, is breaking I think, through. I think pa Paula has uh, connect, I think, uh, connect, connect, connectivity di difficulties and I think is out of sync at the moment. So I'm not sure ah. if she can. she's actually in sync with our discussion. Uh, let's see. Do you hear us, Paula? OK. We're talking about uh, the, there's also Katerina's <laughs> point here. Uh, there's a delay on you, Paula, of about uh, of five, six seconds which is due to your Wi-Fi probably. I'm already. Um, the Katerina is saying, mean, John, that uh, the, do you start yes, is, I do. Do a needs analysis and you find that the profiles are so diverse that it's impossible to start the course. Does that happen? Well, I suppose I'd started from that assumption, but then clearly mm -hmm. that's that's not operationally very useful because you just end up with a kind of utter diversity and, and um, maybe you can look at overarching factors and some of those might be the kind of institutional and educational structures which people come from you know the kind of educational programs they've been through in school or college uh, you know in Lebanon or in Palestine you know because that allows some basis for a useful generalization and then maybe also and, and that's not actually just generalizations about structures and institutions and organizations but also how those institutions and those educations deliver education what it looks like over there you know and, and uh, again at the risk of generalization it might be highly didactic content based transmissive and teacher centered you know and that, if that's what it is however different it might be from what we do that's where we're needing to start from um, and I guess there's also you know a generalizable remarks about differences in culture you know w which cultures are more risk-taking or risk averse or more individualistic or more collectivist and is that a basis for looking at um, generalized differences in the approaches we can we can take I, I mean I'm only trying to present operational ways to answer the question I don't think they're kind of necessarily necessarily intellectually rigorous and they're only questions not answers sorry about that okay But did you find that did, did you find that the profiles were too diverse? So, oh, so uh, about my side, just to go back very quick, I don't know if you heard my reply to Katerina. We did a needs analysis. Uh, that. No, it wasn't. We were able to understand what was uh, so, and that is one of the things because we used already communication. So what we did it was we were using Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, it was Google Plus, uh, British Council website. So those participants replied to the needs need, need analysis were people who are already online. Uh, so we got Google. Uh, it allowed us to understand what were their needs and what they would like to learn. So the whole program and the way we defined it, it was based on these trainees analysis. If any of the calls would like to have it, I can share with them the, the trainees analysis. And uh, so it was a great way to understand what were their expectations and what they wanted to learn. Uh, if we're talking about, because it was targeted to Syrian refugees, uh, and that is something that we need to be very clear. If I was looking at, F, at, call, at the students from Africa, then it would have a different, very diverse uh, group. But it was just targeted to them. So it was something that we came across, very interesting results. OK, moving on. Uh, we'd like to get really the refugee perspective. and. Uh, 
I'd like to invite Jennifer to uh, put her video on and get the sound going, and we'll move on to her point, because Jennifer is an asylum seeker uh, here in Sweden, and has been incredibly active in getting into the university and continuing her uh, her research and studies and helping a situation herself. So I'll have... Okay, so... Um... Good afternoon, and so this is, it is my pleasure to share you to share with you my thoughts today. And so, what I'll be sharing or what I'll be presenting is based on my own experience uh, in working in the university um, as a project coordinator for validation of competency for asylum seekers and refugees. And aside from the fact that I myself is not even a refugee yet, but still an asylum seeker. So here it goes. Um, I think I need my first uh, slide. Uh, okay. So um, um, in my second slide, um, there is like, this is what the refugees perspective. So I myself, I can say that education is the key to integration. So um, I strongly believe that uh, education will help the refugees and asylum seeker to rebuild their lives in the host, in their new host country. Because, um, Experiencing war is really tragic, like hearing the bullets and gunshots, seeing dead people on the street uh, will really uh, affect you psychologically. Uh, and, um, and knowing like it's just a wink of an eye, everything that you have is gone. So I think uh, for having to um, integrate into the new host country, it will help them regain their knowledge and will help re uh, get them regain their knowledge and uh, enhance their skills and um, so they can also like align their skills in the educational standard of the host country they are in and to be prepared in the labor market so i will share to you my um, i will share to you my my project, so my project in the NIOS University is um, called uh, Validation of Competency for Asylum Seekers and Refugees. So we had our, our um, pilot testing, pilot test uh, last uh, year. We started like February. So this is called Validation of Competency for Asylum Seekers and Refugees. So we from the Department of Computer Science in Linnaeus University initiated a validation of skills. So we were, our main goal is to bridge the gap, bridging the gap of um, the asylum, uh, the education that the asylum seekers acquired in their home country to the uh, like for us, Sweden, so Swedish uh, educational standard. So to make them prepare for the labor market. So what we did is um, uh, we are assisting them uh, uh, to get into the university to complement their studies. So uh, because most of them uh, are interested to get into the university, but they don't know what to do or they don't know how to start or when to start. So for us, we're assisting them like they're registering or creating an account into the university admission, advising them what to do to fulfill the requirements. And we also give them some validation uh, test. We ask them to assess their, themselves because um, we believe that the best thing who can assess you is yourself. If you will be honest, of course, and some interview. So we are doing this uh, integration, and so um, we uh, come up with a pilot test. So the next slide um, will give you like 
we categorize them into three main tracks. So the first track is um, applicant with uh, with um, no college education. We also have applicant with um, um, the applicant with um, who started some college, and some applicant who have finished their college uh, education with some uh, with some. Uh, ed, um, I'm sorry, with this, some working experiences. So in our pilot test, we have a track, like uh, for track one, we got, uh, actually we started with like 14 applicants. And some, uh, due to various reasons, these applicants uh, did not uh, pursue because some of them got a job, some of them has no documentation. So only eight uh, proceeded. And, um, so two fall into track one, four applicants fall on track two, and two applicants fall on track three. And basically, um, the one who just uh, accepted or pursue is our two applicants for our autumn uh, 2016 uh, class. So they have started, and some of the, the two of them has two different experiences. Okay, so one of them uh, cope with cope up with with uh, the learning, the new learning uh, process, and uh, or the new learning system, and the other didn't. Uh, he found difficulty uh, when it comes to distance education, so it's hard for him to work alone. Okay, so aside from this, we also are um, working with asylum seekers. And for, asy uh, for asylum seekers, um, we are also assisting them. And uh, since they do not have the capability or the capacity to pay for the tuition fee, we have this scholarship program uh, for asylum seekers. And last, uh, in the pilot um, test, we have 10, uh, we offered or we gave uh, 10 uh, as, um, scholarships for asylum seekers from our uh, program also. So, and for nowadays, my our applicants, I am advising them to use MOOCs. So I gave them um, uh, links to Coursera and uh, to Adrat and to other to other um, websites where they can learn, even though they are in the asylum camps that comes, refugee comes. So, and then I asked them some feedback and most of the feedback I got, so I will start with the opportunities or the advantages of using MOOCs for refugees. So, first is they can gain new knowledge and skills, of course, uh, complement or deepen prior learning, and they can challenge to think critically and interact with participants. So, but this one is uh, most of um, the one who can really do this are those who can really, uh, who are familiar with the language. So most of them who is, uh, who's enjoying the opportunity of bullet number three uh, knows uh, English or who can speak English uh, and understand English fluently. Then they learn to empower themselves to create change. They're giving, just like it gives them hope because they're acquiring new knowledge uh, for, through books. And they discover new topics um, based on their fields. They discover not actually new teachers, but new teaching styles and new ways of learning, especially this MOOC. And um, they can get certification somehow, of course, uh, for for the for this uh, opportunity um, with the MOOC. Okay, and then uh, for the next slide, I will um, give you the um, challenges. Um, for the challenges, actually, uh, we have uh, the three main barriers. Okay, three main obstacles, the technology, the culture, and the linguistics. Uh, so 
for the traditional barriers. So still, though we are in the computer world nowadays, uh, but still there are people who are not into using uh, computers. So it's, or they are not used to uh, online learning. So especially for elder people. And some are, the female participation is a bit low. Okay, for the, uh, for the reason. Um, and then, so the computer literacy, illiteracy. So some are afraid to hold the computer because they don't know. And for the refugee comms, they said that uh, facilities, most of the refugee comms are not equipped with good computers and internet connection. So some of them, those who are really interested, they're just using their mobile phones to access with, with um, the internet. Or even there's an internet connection in the camp, sometimes it is really weak for them. And then, of course, the language barrier, though, uh, but nowadays uh, there are a lot of um, uh, um, organizations who are who started to develop um, MOOCs that will adapt to the languages of the the asylum seekers and refugees. So, like the Adrak, so it's also in Arabic. So it is really a good one. And for the retention, yeah, as what pa I saw that in Paula's uh, presentation also, which is really correct. It's really hard to uh, for the retention. Uh, yeah, yeah, for the retention of the um, the asylum seekers to be in the MOOC classes. Okay, and then oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so well, uh, that's it. And maybe uh, well, we'd li I'd like to I'd like to bring in some of the the participants uh, if we've got a, a little bit of time here to just sort of uh, get some questions rounded up. We have oh. a if we. Quickly move over here. We have um, a question you want uh, them to answer, mm -hmm. Jennifer. Here, from your perspective, your own. Pers how, what do you think is needed to help refugees in coping with the mm -hmm. challenges of MOOCs? And uh, if you just go to that uh, little um, uh, square, the box, and uh, write a quick answer there. What What do we need? Uh, Jennifer gave quite a lot of ideas there, but. Uh, you know, the coping with the challenges, what's the answer? Uh, if you could put them in, in that uh, box there. There's a lot of stuff in the chat as well here. Sonal and uh, Chrysanthi are uh, coming. Uh, I don't know if you have time to read them, Jennifer, while people are writing in the other one. OK. Uh -huh, so it is, um, thank you also. There's something you do in order to address. Yeah. Or you know, how do we get more women involved? Uh, yeah, so um, maybe by um, uh, by um, inviting them to or let them feel that uh, they can um, can be developed. Them they can develop themselves because uh, first thing also is like they feel ashamed. To participate, and uh, because of um, perhaps the, the knowledge, but uh, we have to give them some support, uh, some motivation on uh, to participate. Because if you will feel welcome, just like my own experience, if you feel welcome into a group or into a society, so you you really like going to to it. But if you feel like not welcome, so it's just like you will pity yourself and you will just stay home. Yeah, something like that. Meaning we should adapt and move, not adapt the learners. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> completely agree. Yes, actually. Um, else? Mm -hmm. Questions? We're getting some answers in here. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. 
Access, access to digital learning centers for support, uh, badges as sort of rewards for being involved, uh, support and feedback from mentors. Uh, uh, That's like I think. Nice yeah, the, buddy systems seem to be popular as well. Getting some a trusted person to help you on your way. Maybe there's a lovely project in Sweden at the moment where um, refugee, yeah, various as sort of refugees with IT skills are being used uh, as mentors for elderly people mm -hmm. and helping them get get online. So that it's like uh, they're helping the older generation. And uh, it's giving them a, they they feel they feel good sharing their knowledge, and the older people trust them. Yeah, and uh, in Veco also the Rotary Club of Veco, they have this uh, mentorship program for refugees and asylum seekers. So they are they there are uh, like volunteered Swedish uh, nationals in Veco, and they are partnering with uh, some refugees. So they will talk, they will meet and practice their Swedish language. So yeah, it is, I think, uh, one good practice also. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, trusted, experienced people help, but getting people to help each other. But I think you need, uh, with the digital literacy matter and even with language, you need, you need a friend. You need somebody in a way to hold your hand, somebody you trust, somebody you're, somebody you're close to that you can sort of ask the stupid questions that you wouldn't ask a sort of more a person you feel is some sort of authority figure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in most European countries, I mean, libraries, learning centers, community centers, uh, churches, there's lots of organizations that can play a part in this and are already doing so. There are some excellent projects around. I'd like to invite uh, John and Paula to come back into the interview because I'd like to round off our webinar. Uh, time goes very quickly. Uh, and I will just move over to a fight. Oh, sorry, sorry. I will move over to this view. I'll just explain a little bit before we wrap up here. Uh, please, some comments on the webinar. Was it useful? Uh, what would you like to know more about? Uh, what sort? Of, just, just general feedback is always excellent. Um, over on the right, you'll see slides to download. So you just click on wh whose slides you would like to see and uh, upload file, and you can collect them. There are also some links to the organizations behind this uh, down at the bottom right. So sort of final remarks from the three of you. Paula, any, any sort of fi uh, a, a minute of final thoughts? Well, just to let you know that I have already shared on the chat the link to the needs analysis so that you can uh, you can uh, have access to it. As for the for final thoughts, it's just that we need, as John was saying, is critical that we go for the participants, for the students, and not the other way around, adapted to address their needs, to address their reality, to address the context that they are living uh, right now. The other thing that I'd like to share with you is that, uh, and it is a little bit of a, we all could be in the same situation. It all could be, uh, happen to any of us. We just were lucky that we are in a different place in a different time, because anything like this can happen to any of us. And uh, we are talking about human beings, about someone who has a specific name, with a specific face, who has family, who has kids, children, who has... Uh, so please always bear that in mind when we are looking at providing solutions, at providing service, at providing whatever you want to provide, uh, that there is a name there and there is a person. Uh, besides just the name or the tag of refugee. And I'll pass on to John and have a great day as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> John? Thank you. Uh, I guess I'd only say something very, very, very similar, actually, that um, I'm conscious of how little we know um, and how we need to work together and find out more. 
about what is needed, but the only people really who are going to tell us that stuff are the potential learners themselves, the refugees and the refugee communities and the countries and communities from which they come. And so I'm just very nervous about us jumping too quickly, too powerfully, too soon, uh, to assumptions, to implementations, to uh, institutions, to standards, uh, without checking, without finding out uh, first. We're only here to help and to serve. Jennifer? Oh, um, anyway, I just um, want to answer uh, the one who asked for that. Uh, for, it's actually on my slide, the one that I was supposed to do. So um, what I can say is um, uh, we are all doing refugee. Uh, we are working with refugees and asylum seekers. And even though we do little thing, as long as it is it is coming from our heart. It will be really appreciated by us. So yeah, you can continue um, sharing and and doing projects for it. But just remember, it, it should be from the heart because small little things will really will be really appreciated by us. Thank you. Lovely. I'm so, uh, I, I realize that Jennifer's uh, slideshow that was in the slides to download down there, that it, 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 it the, that wasn't working. I've now replaced it, and if you click on her slides, you will now be able to download it, because I've just checked that it works, and I hope it's the same for Paola's and John's. These will be downloadable even in the recording, so if you don't manage to do it just now, you can do it later. Uh, so everything else works in the recording as well. It's uh, a little bit past four o'clock here, and uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, oh, uh, does Linda want to say something about the conference in Gothenburg? You have microphone rights. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes, so the conference in Gothenburg will be on the 12th of June. And you are all welcome to come to Sweden if you have the possibility. I can post the link again, uh, or actually, is it still here, Alistair, somewhere? It'll be uh, anyway. beginning of the chat somewhere, but you can put it in again. The of the chat. I'll put it in the chat again. And uh, so the conference is free of charge, and it's the AMIF, the Asylum Migration and Integration Funded Project. Um, from the Swedish Migration Board. It's a European project where we work with uh, developing mobile technology for Arabic-speaking migrants in Sweden. So we will have the, uh, Professor Agnes Kokolska holm as the uh, keynote speaker and also some other um, uh, people speaking within the area of mobile learning and migration. So you're all welcome to this um, conference and it will be really nice seeing you there. Okay, thanks. Thanks Linda from Gothenburg. Finally, uh, we'll be back with another webinar on the 30th of May with more on this topic. Uh, we will mail you details in due course. You will all get uh, the link to the recording of the webinar fairly soon. I can't promise if it's tomorrow or the next day. It's not me that does it. Uh, but very, very soon, you will also all get a badge for your participation that you can put on your LinkedIn profile or wherever you want to put it. But you will all be receiving an Eden badge for participation. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll hang on a little bit if you want to chat or say anything. I'll open the microphones. But now I'm going to close the recording. <laughs>